I'd like to welcome you to this pre-recorded service on YouTube. I hope we will all be blessed together as we worship and look at God's word together. Do feel free to chat with each other using live chat. I'd just like to say there is also a live service going on at the Canal Basin at the same time as this. If you do feel able to join the live service at the Canal Basin at any point over the summer, don't forget to take a mask unless you're exempt. And if you have the NHS COVID app to use the QR code upstairs when you arrive as the downstairs one is for boat residents. Also, don't forget to take a drink if you might need one and be aware that doors and windows will be kept open as much as possible. There will also be a service at the Canal Basin on the 8th of August, but on the 16th of August, we're planning to have a picnic at Ashridge. And I think our last notice for this morning is that on Monday the, the 2nd of August, that's tomorrow, we have our monthly prayer meeting on Zoom. Let's pray now as we start our service. Father, still our hearts and be with us, we pray. May your spirit lift our worship to you and make Jesus very real to us. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's have our first worship song, I Am Who You Say I Am. Whether you want to just watch and listen to the words or sing along, let's worship the Lord together in song. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I His grace runs deep While I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me Yes, He died for me
your eyes and use your imagination here. And let's go on a journey and also back in time. It's AD 55. And we've arrived at the same time as a delegation from the church in Corinth in Greece to visit Paul in Ephesus across the Aegean Sea. It's a beautiful area. And we might think, looking at our maps, that these two places are very close together. But in fact, the journey from the city and port of Corinth would have taken them a little under a week's journey in favourable winds, longer otherwise. And in winter, they'd have needed to take the much longer land route. And they're in Ephesus, you hear, together with Paul, news from Corinth and are with him as he receives a letter brought by the delegation from this young church family. That the delegation was Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. The church in Corinth is not yet five years old, but it's certainly taken a lot of Paul's time and attention to say nothing of his hours in prayer. He knows these people. He knows these believers very well. They are a vibrant church where everybody wants to do something in their gatherings, where there is lots of evidence of spiritual gifts, including speaking in tongues, and the people are really focused on Christ's return. Such a joy to Paul in many ways. And yet, and yet, such a disparate and volatile group. Stephanus and the others have brought a long list of questions and problems. The believers are tending to idolise those who first challenge them about faith in Jesus or who made a significant contribution to their learning and are showing signs of misunderstanding both the message of faith and the role of their leaders. And they are not really sharing meals before they have communion when they remember Christ's death. Instead, it's rather like a bring and share meal without the sharing. Rather, everyone eats their own food and has their own wine, and if they got rather a lot, then you can imagine what happens. And morally, things are really out of hand. Grace and freedom in the gospel seem to have been taken by some as a license to do what they like. And they seem to have misunderstood Paul's previous letter as well. Definitely time for him to write again. Well, of course, we're not really with Paul or Stephanus and his friends, and it's not AD 55. But can you feel something of Paul's frustration and concern as he addresses problems in this church he had established? Let's join together in worshipping again with the song, The Golden Rule is Love. This is one I've learned during lockdown, and I must admit, I rather enjoy it. So let's sing. The golden rule is love and so we love one another like he loves us. God said to us, the golden rule is love and so we love one another like he loves us. It means we love, 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 love one another. Oh, we're gonna love like him. It means we love, 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 love one another. Oh, we're gonna love like him.
We started a new series of talks last Sunday on the church defined. COVID has made many of us stop and think, what is church? Is it church when we sit in front of our computers or with our phones watching online? What might church look like as we move ahead? And we are looking at what the Bible can teach us. Let's turn to our reading now. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians and chapter 3 and from verse 9 to verse 17. And Chris is going to read for us. Okay. Uh, this morning's reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace of God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. The church in Corinth was having problems. In fact, it was at risk of fragmenting into small groups who had very strong preferences when it came to their leaders or teachers. To the point even of saying, I follow, well, it might have been Paul or Apollos or Peter or one of the others, whichever was their preference, and they discounted the others. And for whatever reason they were doing this, it was not helpful to the healthy growth of the church or its members, and not a good image of faith to show the non-believers around them. Paul uses different metaphors, different images for the church to help make his point that they were together church and the Holy Spirit lived in them. They needed each other. They all had something to offer each other for the good of all. And having started by using the metaphor of growing a crop, which Paul planted and Apollos watered, he moves on to a different way of explaining his point. The church, which is a group of people following Jesus, can be compared to a building. And not just any building, but a temple. Temples were familiar. They were thought of as places where people could go to be in the presence of their gods or goddesses. Paul probably thought of the temple in Jerusalem, but Corinth had several different temples, enough for Paul to make his point. Paul laid the foundation, the teaching about Jesus, who was crucified for their sins and ours, who died and was buried, and who was raised from the dead on the third day, who had ascended into heaven, but would come back. A good foundation was needed for any building to stand. Moving away from the foundation would result in a structure that would not last long at all. Paul mentions several different materials here. All good and valid materials used in the construction and embellishment of buildings at the time. Gold, 
silver, precious stones, wood, hay and straw, each with their uses. Think of all the wood that went into building your house. And at the time, hay and straw would have been used as a binding material to make bricks and do any plaster work. Gold, silver and precious stones would embellish the work, make it look really attractive. So all useful materials, but some more eye-catching than others, and they varied considerably in value. Although building work at different stages could potentially be held up waiting for a fresh buyer of any of them. Which is not, of course, his main point here. What he is focused on is what would best survive a fire. Paul isn't talking about fire as a punishment for wrongdoing, as a judgment in that sense, but as something that would test, would evaluate whether the builders had built well and built on the right foundation. And to understand this better, we need to think about what could potentially damage not a building, but the group of people who are the church. And what could potentially show the work of any particular teacher or leader to be inadequate? What would test the work of the different people contributing to the development of the church? Well, in Paul's time, persecution was a big risk. If believers were not well grounded in their faith, would they survive as believers? Being a follower of Jesus might mean losing work or losing a large part of their pre previous social networks, especially when they couldn't join in with all of the activities that went on. And could at, time mean, could at times mean loss of liberty or loss of life? Paul goes on to underline that he is not referring to just any building. The church the group of people who are following Jesus is the temple of God. God's spirit lives in them, in their gatherings. Yes, the spirit also dwells in them individually. Paul will talk about that later in his letter. But here he speaks of and to the group of believers. And the way some of the believers were associating themselves with one of the teachers or leaders and forming smaller groups was damaging God's temple, the place where his spirit dwells. And those builders, the Christian teachers and leaders, well, their work might survive a catastrophic event or not. Most were not maliciously trying to cause damage. That would have been a different problem. They we're looking at what the church should look like at the time, what it should be doing in its context and the culture of the day, what its focus should be. And they needed to be open to what the Holy Spirit was asking them to do and to be in their time. And we too need to be open to God's Spirit as we work together and see what our church this group of people following Jesus, this temple of God, will look like in the days ahead, in our context, and the culture of our day. What does it mean to you to be part of the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit dwells? What difference does it make to our dwellings, to our gatherings? Sorry, what difference does it make to our gatherings? What difference does it make to what we do when we meet, whether online or in person? Let's sing again, or just listen if you prefer, and think a little bit about what we've just been looking at. We're going to sing how great thou art.
sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul.
We're going to turn to prayer now and pray together. So let's pray. Father, we pray for the people struggling with COVID and the challenges it is still bringing, for the disappointments of changed plans for the summer, and for all our key workers who continue to work with the extra pressures and uncertainties of the pandemic. We pray for those in our church who work for the NHS. Give them renewed courage and strength, we pray. We pray for all who have lost loved ones to COVID, for all who have not been able to find closure because they could not attend funerals, for all who have struggled with isolation, for those with mental health problems. For our young people and children with so many disruptions to their education. And for those who are uncertain and fearful of what easing of restrictions may bring, give them, give us renewed courage and strength, we pray. And for all of us, as we continue our journey of following Jesus together, for our meetings and activities over the summer, we pray. And we pray that you would lead us as you want us to go. We pray for Phil as he rep- returns from his sabbatical and shares with us something of what he's learned. And above all, Lord, we pray that you would give us renewed courage and strength. In Jesus' name, we pray. I'm going to finish now with a a blessing and then we'll turn to our final hymn. So I'll say goodbye and have a good rest of the day and week. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
Shut it. 